This is the second part of our Newsmaker interview with David Wallerstein. He is the Chief Exploration Officer at Tencent. And if you want to know what that's about, you got to watch part one because we are moving on. All right. <laughs> I'm with you on this one. The Wall Street Journal called you the man who bets Tencent's moonshot money. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> right. So to what, me, is, yeah. what does this mean? How do you, do you see yourself yeah. like this? Well, I think I like the, the concept of a moonshot. Sometimes it feels a little bit unrealistic, like you're embracing some crazy idea. Mm -hmm. But then I start thinking, well, what's a moonshot at the end of the day? And a moonshot is really having this big goal, like getting to the moon and then doing all of these things to optimize for that goal. Like you have to build life support systems, you know, funny spacesuits, uh, <laughs> rockets, all this cool stuff that may not be that useful in other contexts initially anyways. We find out later that the technology can apply to other things. But you're, you're really trying to optimize everything you can to ensure success towards your goal, which is getting to the moon. And I feel like this is a really important mindset now for the planet because we have to figure out as the planet as humanity, what are our moonshot goals? And I think we need to have them. For one, we need to fight climate change, for example. Okay. How can we say, we need to fight climate change? What are all the tools we need to build that maybe in another context aren't so valuable, like carbon sequestration uh, technologies, you know, putting CO2 that we emit through our daily actions into the ground or somewhere else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do we build the technologies to do that so we directly fight this climate change? And I think the moonshot thinking is so important. So, so for me, I, I really tr try to think about goals. And I, I try to focus less on any specific technology because we may always be surprised uh, where a solution can come from. Uh, a solution to fight climate change could come from an efficiency process that just results in less CO2 being emitted. It could be less CO2 emitted from a coal fire plant, which still exists on Earth, or a car or something like that. Let's, and coal let's fire embrace plants are everything. still being built on a daily basis. Yes. And China is an example. Yes. I mean, yes. Uh, you know, I, sometimes it just feels like a real moonshot. Yeah, but we have to push and we have to talk about this more and we have to show how other technologies are a much better way to go. And then we have to, if there is existing infrastructure like coal fire plants on Earth, we have to assume that maybe they're all not going to get shut down as fast as we like them to. So what can we do immediately to make them operate as efficiently as possible? What can we do to capture that gas, that deadly gas, and put it right back into the Earth? What can we do to, to help this uh, coal-fired plant or a thermoelectric plant to operate as efficiently as possible, to use the least amount of coal or biomass possible, um, to use the least amount of water possible, and get the maximum amount of electrons? That's what we want out of the process, is we want electricity. And that's, that's about productivity. So actually, a utility embracing these solutions is going to they should be more profitable. They're, mm -hmm. they're wasting less and they're making more money because they've got more of their targeted output. I believe we can use a lot of these new technologies like artificial intelligence to push along efficiency. And I think that's really important right now. But there's many, many strategies uh, may come in from the left field. We may not be expecting it. It may not be uh, carbon sequestration technology. It may not be right. an AI technology. And we have to be open to that. As long as we stay focused on our goal, the goal is fighting climate change to reduce the emission of these greenhouse gases and then being very open to the unexpected mm -hmm. uh, solution, the thing that maybe doesn't even seem like it should work. But then you have to be willing to investigate it and learn about it and say, actually, this could be something perfect. But you stay focused on your objectives. That's the important thing. You just brought up AI and, you know, there's always a lot of discussion about, you know, AI having been, been Europe having been at the beginning yeah. of the AI evolution and now it's, now it feels like it's trying to catch up a bit. How do you see it? Yeah, well, do you I think, think Europe can catch up. There, you know, I'd say we're in the, the very early days of the development of AI. First of all, I think AI is a lot more like, um, it's a lot more akin to like computer science to me. It's kind of a, a technological approach that you can do all kinds of things with that can apply to anything, just like code can apply to any restaurant, any business. It can be a new business in itself. Uh, AI can be applied to anything. It can optimize anything. It can find patterns in anything. Yeah. And, what's, and I think what is not being um, embraced so much by the AI community currently right now are these areas of kind of industrial optimization. Uh, applying AI to energy. I mean, who's doing that? Who's doing that really perfectly? So we're, we're matching uh, supply and demand in energy networks as perfectly as possible. Or even applying AI to, uh, to power generation just to have more operational efficiency in this area. This is totally wide open. And to me, this is a perfect area for Europe to embrace because Europe has such deep expertise in industrial processes. Uh, 
a, a deep care with the population regarding topics like climate change, quality of life improvements. Yeah. These are something that are that's talked about daily across the region. And I think it's such an early stage right now for the technology. Europe has this chance to really be the leader in these areas. So tell me if, if, if there's a, a somebody who has their startup and they're focused on sustainability in these areas and they want to talk to you, yeah. they want to know how they can plug in, be part of your yeah. 10 cent exploration. Yeah. I mean, what is your criteria to invest in a company? Right, okay. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> there's three or four things that we would look for. Um, all of them are important. I think, first of all, we want to see at least for my team, you know, is this company targeting a really important challenge? That has to be one of the key things. And, and we're not trying to be too specific. I might talk about food, energy, and water. I might talk about climate change, but they, there could be a team that approaches and says, have you thought about this thing over here? Mm -hmm. And we may not have, but we want to be very open to that. We're not saying we have all the answers, but we want it to be something that's at a, at a global scale. Some kind of technology that can apply to everyone around the world, something that applies to both people in developed nations, wealthy people, and uh, people in developing nations, people, people with greater needs. We want it to apply universally, something that's valuable. Everyone on this planet can, can benefit from clean water, for example. Right. Doesn't matter where you're from, you need clean water. This is a great example. Uh, then we need to see a solution that's really compelling. Uh, it needs to be economical, it needs to work. You get the idea. Right, right. The final thing is really founder and management team excellence which we've come to appreciate more and more over time because you could have everything lining up. You could have a wonderful solution, a wonderful technology, something with a lot of patents behind it, really smart. Right. Obviously a hugely important problem, but the team for some reason has a hard time. A hard time getting sales, a hard time explaining what they're doing, a hard time, I think of it a little bit like sports. Mm -hmm. When you're playing tennis, every return of that ball that comes in your court is important. You right. know, if you hit it out of bounds, you just lost a point. Right. If you missed the ball, you lost a point. We're those teams that every opportunity that comes, and there's going to be 20 a day that come in, they can hit that ball pretty intelligent. They make a really high quality decision every time. They're hitting that, you know, and winning point after point after point. Those are the teams that tend to succeed over time. And it's really hard to, to describe how we can identify those teams. That's very much a qualitative, personal skill. We're still learning, but we've been doing it for a long time. I think we just have to get to know the founder team's better, okay. and we need all these things to line up. And, and when they line you, up, sorry, how much can you spend? Um, I mean, well, does it depend? Yeah, in the past couple years, I, I've done quite a few seed stage deals, a couple hundred thousand dollars here and there, you know, that range. Okay. And I was also involved in our investment in Tesla. You know, a publicly listed company. It's a couple billion dollars of investment there. Um, so in my work, we can, we can, you know, work in the full the full life cycle of a company. It could be even a public company that we would uh, make an investment in. And we just want to see that these, uh, these kind of criteria are being met and we can, we can invest uh, very flexibly. We, I don't have, just to clarify, I yeah. don't have a, a venture capital team. We're not a specific fund. We, you know, I do my investing with my team on behalf of the Tencent Corporation, on behalf of the executive team. And right. we talk about these investments within our executive team, even a small seed stage investment of a few hundred thousand uh, francs, euros, dollars. Okay. We'll actually even talk about it um, yeah, within our, our most senior executive team. So mm -hmm. people are aware of what we're doing in the market. They're aware of the kinds of solutions coming out there that we're thinking as an executive team, how we might be able to foster these technologies a little bit more. So in a way, I, I tell uh, founders, sometimes I, I might say, uh, when we're talking about investing in someone, right. I might say, uh, you know, we met one day, then the next day we meet again, I said, you know, I was talking to our CEO about your company last night. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a big deal, you know, because yeah. we're a big company. <laughs> we're like, excited. really? Really? He's like, yeah, yeah, we were, he actually has some suggestions for you. you yeah. know? So that's kind okay. of cool to be able to do a things good, that way. A good dialogue. You, so you mentioned being involved in Tesla. You've also, you were also there in the QQ, and in the, the early, early days. We, in the early days in yeah. WeChat. Yep. Um, is there any link to what you do now to, to these um, projects or? Well, in some ways yes, in some ways no. So I've been in Tencent for so long. I mean, I. Hey, you're I, like a lifer there. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a really a lifer. CNN, so I mean, I it's it. almost 20 years, right? And so <laughs> yeah. first of all, like almost every executive that's in the company, uh, well, a certain kind of senior executive. I remember their first day. Their first day in the company might have been 2002, 2003, 2004. Mm. So 
those are just deep ties that I, I have. And when we have some of our executive meetings and we all get together, maybe there's 500 or 1,000 of us, you know, we, there's so much history there when I, you see a, a manager who maybe you started working with 15 years ago and then you kind of, you haven't seen each other for a few years and then you re-engage and all the memories come up. And so we, I, I'm, I'm able to, I think it's a little bit unique to my position, to navigate across the, the company quite well, depending on what the issue is, depending on what the opportunity is. And that can be very helpful to our portfolio companies, depending on what the opportunity is. I think at the end of the day, um, when you look at the value of what the corporation has off, to offer something new, um, let's say something in, in the healthcare space, is that we have a lot of users, we have a lot of reach, we have a lot of ability to communicate um, what's happening in the market with trends through our, our content portal. So we're one of the largest media companies in China, kind yes. of like what CNN would do. We have news reporting, we have uh, content sharing articles, things like that. So we can actually also uh, talk about important topics in the society. Um, we, can, uh, we have payments, we have online resources. Right. So it really so, depends on what the company needs. And we have our operating experience. I mean, we've, everything we've done at some point in the company was small with you know, five people, 10 people, 50 people, and then we had to grow it to pretty massive scale. And we, we, we work as operators actually. So Tencent, even though we're doing investing and we work with entrepreneurs around the world, at the end of the day, what we probably do best is just operating our own stuff and having it work well 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, it's not easy. Um, you know, you get hackers and all kinds of problems in your network. So you, gotta, you have a stable network, you have to have a safe network and all those things. Right. Um, so it just really depends on, on the case. But I think having all of this, this kind of operational capability, having all the historic operational experience, it can be useful to a team in, in different ways. And what I try to do at the same time is kind of bring diverse teams together. So the question is how can uh, someone working in WeChat think a little bit more about a water challenge or something like that. That's okay. an ongoing struggle, but yeah. I like to try to make that happen in the company. Uh, as my, in my role, is. that's kind of my internal role, is talking about these challenges and you know, talking about it with different teams that we have. Mm -hmm. And also, even though their daily job might be working on a game or something like that, thinking about these other issues and kind of, kind of getting that brainstorming type of thought process going. Mm -hmm. And um, it's always hard to say exactly where a connection is made or something new comes up, but what I like to do is, is kind of get the corporation ready to have people thinking about more ideas of this nature and how we can be doing more to cross-pollinate. Mm -hmm. But it's an ongoing question, never, probably will never end, probably be ongoing for the history of the company. Yeah. Um, any chance that Tencent will list again in China? Oh, uh, that wouldn't be <laughs> my area of expertise. Um, but uh, if it's NASDAQ, the right decision you know, for the company, I'm supportive if it's the yeah. right thing, but I, I don't decide on things like that, yeah. And one last question: um, When you when you walk into a room uh, out, outside of China, obviously yeah. uh, to uh, places around the world, international, when you walk into a room and you say, "I come from Ten Cent," yeah, what is the reaction that you get? Uh, I'm yeah, it always feels pretty good to me, but yeah. you don't know what people say behind your back. Um, but it feels pretty good. I think, look, as a company in business, um, you always are under pressure to provide some value. I mean, if you have no value to offer, it's a really competitive market out there. So if you're not offering value, people probably don't want to take your meetings, they don't want to read your pamphlet, your brochure, your idea for something. So you know, we've been facing that since the very beginning of the company. You know, do we have anything of value to offer? And that's the discipline we have in the company. We're always thinking about user value, and we're always thinking about building that, and then how can we build value with partners? How can we not waste people's time? Um, it's just an ongoing struggle for us. I think. Um, I think you know, we try to do a really good job there. I think it's been pretty welcoming, and I think we have a lot to offer, a lot of experience to offer, a lot of resources, unique types of experience. We have a very unique type of business model. Um, you know, China's a really interesting market, obviously a very everybody important big to, market. Yeah, everybody wants to be in China. Yeah, yeah I mean, we want to welcome as many uh, companies to come this, in as I guess because there's always a question of transparency. You know, whenever you bring yeah. up China, there's always this question of, well, yeah. but can you trust the information that's coming out of there? Yeah, I, well, um, I think that's a good question for people to apply at all times for any company or any organization from any country because you shouldn't, uh, I mean, that kind of uh, skepticism should apply to anyone. Why would you just only apply to one kind of country or one kind of language or something? So I think that's good. I mean, let's be really rigorous. Let's be very thoughtful about who we're dealing with and why we're dealing with them and what their objectives are. Are they talking about, does everyone share uh, a passion for the environment? Is everyone willing to go out there and talk? 
about it. I think this is the this is always uh, the challenge. But I think um, to answer the question more directly, I think the reception's been been pretty good. So, uh, but you know, this issue about value and proving that you have something valuable to offer, and that we have something to share, that never ends. That's the battle that we have to fight every morning, every meeting, every time we're asked to speak somewhere. And that's a very good discipline to have. You never get, you never get a free ride. And that's, our customers expect that from us every day. They're going to expect it tomorrow morning. Are our services working well? Yeah. Did they become a little bit better? So I think that's all we can do is just try to improve every day. So what's that next investment that's on your mind that, that's, that you're, you're putting your next seed money into? Can you say? <laughs> that's your next interview, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, so then final, final question. Yeah. You're, a, you're a climate champion. Um, what do you think of Greta? Oh my gosh. I'm so inspired. I mean, you know, it's so amazing to see someone stand up and say the most fundamental, kind of almost obvious things, but say them with such a power that just makes us think about the issue um, differently. And I think that is so important right now because we're really at the stage, I think, as humanity of needing to think about these issues more, needing to focus on them more. And, and I think with that, this is like really the moonshot setting aspect. We have to decide that we want to go to the moon. We have to decide that we want to solve this challenge. Everyone has to get on the same pace saying this is a priority. It's very real. It's very important. We have to solve it. Once people are clear about that, then we're going to find that there's all these kinds of different solutions available. So many different ways that companies, individuals, governments can play a role. And I think what Greta has done is she just gets that message through and doesn't give up. And I think there's such a great role for young people to play because Right now, some parents complain that your young people are looking at their cell phones all the time and using our services, using other services. You know, it seems like the, the youth today have become a little bit more complacent, very comfortable, and it's so inspiring at the same time to see certain people standing up and really highlighting to us what's so important. And I think we should give young people a lot more credit. You know, we should really listen to them. We should assume that they're capable of doing a lot more than they do. And I think this is one of those things that 20, from year, 20 years from now, we'll look back on today and we'll say, what were you doing that was really backwards? What were you doing that was wrong? And we'll say, why didn't we listen to the young people more? You know, well, there's been different groups that haven't been so enfranchised over history. We look back and say, how could they not have been, had the right to vote? Or how could they not have the right to do that? I think we're going to look back and say, why didn't we foster more participation from young people and embrace them and listen to them? So. I think it's one of the most important things that have happened uh, this year is the, the uh, people like Greta really standing up, really taking the stage and showing us how we should be thinking about things, stimulating this debate and then also encouraging other young people around the world. Um, I'm super excited, super excited and really celebrate them for sure. Thank you. Thank yep. you so much for your time, David. It was a real Thank you. pleasure.